Let's do it. This, <laughs> yes, yes it is. <laughs> so this is our, um, can I really start with another video? I'm so good. No. Okay, I didn't think so. Can you go back, please, to the, to the screen? Yeah. Oh, you're the guy there we go. Oh, so, okay. all right. Grief, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's go back to the slide just before that one, please. Oh, wait, is that one? Oh, that's on back. Okay. I just see it. All right, who can read that for me, please? Anyone? Thanks. Grief is not a disorder, a disease, or a sign of weakness. It is an emotional, physical, and spiritual necessity. The price you pay for love. The only cure for grief is to grieve. And then I don't know if you want me to read the second part, but. No, you don't need to. We tried to do that last week, um, but we didn't really get to the slide. And so I want to just ask you briefly does, is there anything about that that stands out to you? Anything that you like that? that hits you the price you pay for love why is that tell me more um because hmm To be attached to something or to someone, to have that deep rootedness of emotion, to have it wrenched away, it's more, the more love you have associated with it, the more it hurts. That phrase really speaks to me too, like, like the price you pay for love, like I think of um, it's a line in an Egypt Reese song, like the pain means my soul's awake. And then it's a line from a movie. I don't, I think it was a Jim Carrey movie, but like he said, like, if you, if your heart is broken, like that's how you know you have one. Yeah. Like you can't have love or life without that pain. Like it comes with it. I love that, Kieran. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing. I love it. I agree. I think sometimes when we look at grief, all we see is the negative side of grief and it does hurt. It is not great. And none of us appreciates it or enjoys it. But if we choose not to grieve, we're also kissing goodbye. So many good things in our lives. Grief is the sign that you're doing something right. Life is going to hurt. There are things that are going to be really hard to let go of. I'd much rather, <laughs> I'd much rather go through grief than never experience the joy that precedes it. It's, it's good to have invested yourself and to care. It's right. God designed and created us to be that way. And when we care, man, that's powerful. It's motivating. So I want to ask you, if, if you know this saying, you've heard this probably many, many times, uh, but do you agree with it? It is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved. What do you think? Do you agree, disagree? Why? I agree with that. I would rather feel love and hurt rather than not feeling anything at all and just being this machine that goes through life. Yeah. It's better to have experienced it than to, it's better to have experienced it than to not have experienced it. It's better to have experienced the joy of it happening than to not have experienced it at all. Yeah. Yeah. We'd also have like learned for the future for the future from that, like both loving and losing. Yep. It's good, Eric. Yeah. One thing that I think about about my just my life, I feel like the grief has really made me who I am and what I have become upset about like such as leaving Mexico or the life I that chance I didn't live I think it really made me 
who I am and how I think about the world. And I think it really is that important is that it kind of changes your world. Sometimes in a bad way, but also in a good way. Yeah, good. And it makes you realize how important things are to you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. All right, let's go on, Ned. <laughs> I don't know. It might be. So I love this uh, this movie. What movie is this from? How to Train Your Dragon. How to Train Your Dragon. How to Train Thine Dragon. How to Train Thine Dragon. Yeah. I love that. I love it. I love it. Uh, have you guys, what do you guys love about that movie? Is there anything about this movie that you think like fits this, this idea, this concept of, of grieving and overcoming? <laughs> we are still on the quote. It's such a good quote. Never mind. Let's move on to the next slide. <laughs> so one of the things that can be difficult when we're grieving is when we don't have permission to grieve. Oh man. And the sidebar of tonight is this quote. <laughs> what have I done? All right. So the question on this slide, I think is really interesting. Have you ever felt like you don't have permission to grieve? Well, Hiccup didn't have permission to grieve killing a dragon. Yeah. He's a Viking. Right. Exactly. His whole culture was against him, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And his dad was against him, kind of. And kind of view, how did his dad view his grief? Weakness. Weakness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or at worst, betrayal. Betrayal. So reflecting on your own life, have you ever felt like you don't have permission to grieve? And what, what causes this? What, why would why would someone feel like they don't have permission to grieve? I would often, it was mostly myself. I don't recall anyone in my family not giving me permission, but I would often think, oh, things aren't that bad. And it's just a move. Other people have such worse things that happen to them, so I shouldn't be so upset. Yeah. It's part of that, like what we saw in the uh, inside out clip. Oh yeah, I'm overreacting. Yep. I'm overreacting. Mm -hmm. I sort of see that where uh, she, she, where Joy just keeps taking over and keeps trying to say, well, what about this cool thing? What about that cool thing? And moving on to the, all the different cool things kind of takes away your permission to grieve the thing that you're noticing at the time. Um, why else? What else can cause this? What other things? I really like what you said, Olivia. Well, let's discover some together. Sometimes you don't recognize the grief as grief and try to brush it off. Yeah. So this is one that uh, I don't know that this would be the exact language, but maybe it has been. Have you ever been told to stop fussing or something like that? How do your parents communicate that message if they ever have? Or how do your friends communicate that message if they ever have? Or have you communicated that message to uh, maybe a sibling or someone else that you've been with? Get actually annoyed. Yeah, get annoyed. Like if, if you're reacting to a sibling fussing, you're just like, oh my gosh, stop! It's not a big deal. Oh, that's really good, Eva. I yeah, like that. You're right. Me all the time. Yeah. Oh man, fussing can really be annoying. Awesome. 
Sure. Don't interrupt me when I'm teaching. <laughs> That's really true. Uh, I was uh, I was I was in a restaurant today and I heard a baby crying and it was like triggering and I was like, oh man, there is nothing worse than listening to a baby cry and being able to do nothing about it. Like they actually literally torture people with that sound. Really? Yes, yeah. they do. Really? Yes, yeah. they do. That <laughs> and they, cool. Like it's I'm hard to sleep, lie. right? Like it's hard to sleep if you just are typing in baby crying. Yeah, <laughs> who do? Anyway, all I'm saying <laughs> is so when we grieve. It can be really, yeah, that's a, such an interesting insight. It can be really annoying to other people. And if other people show, have you ever been grieving and someone has showed annoyance at your grief? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes like, they're like, oh, I've gone through worse than that. Oh, that's yeah. terrible. The major... You need better friends. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, man. Well, a lot of my friends are kind of just like, they usually, sometimes they get it, but sometimes it's like hard, you know? Yeah. Or you don't want to tell them afraid, afraid of what they'll say. Yeah, that makes sense. Even Why you would you be afraid of what they would say? Because you know, like you've heard your, like them tell you bad stuff and like, oh, this is nothing. Like, yeah. To that. Yeah. That's good. So Eva, I don't, can you hear Eva when she's talking? No, you can't. So Eva's talking about her friends saying that, um, like minimizing her grief, like Elise was talking about, and saying, "Well, I've been through, I've I've been through worse than that." They're, you know, like kind of one-upping the grief story. I've had people minimize or disregard my grieving. Yeah, I can hear her. Oh, you can. So Michaela can hear her. That's nice. Oh, okay. Cool. I can hear her very well, actually. Oh wow! Wow. I feel so loved. That's awesome. <laughs> I guess some people can and some people can. <laughs> Me too. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Yeah. Thank you, Elise. Oh, let's move on, yeah. Have you ever felt like, yeah, well, you've already said you have. Some of you have already talked about how admitting grief can uh, be seen as weakness or a lack of faith. And we already read this. The only cure for grief is to grieve. So I have a question then for this slide. What does it look like for you to grieve? What does grieving actually look like? For me, pretty straightforward. I just, just cry it out. And when I'm done, it feels so much better. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes it takes a couple days, but just that is just great release. For me, it's talking to someone. Talking it out. Nice. It's awesome. I think for me, depending on the weight of the grief, it could be from crying it out over a few days and talking to people and praying about it and just processing it to just simply kind of being sad, accepting that it was hard or I'm upset, and then moving forward. Okay. Crying into the pillow and listening to music. Hey, does anyone else like use music as uh, grief therapy? Yes. Oh, I yeah. Songs and cry to them. <laughs> Eva says she listens to songs and cries to them. All right, let me hear some. What are some of your grief songs? The Battle of Jody Baxter. All right. By Andrew Peterson. Yep. <laughs> no one else is willing to admit their grief songs. Thank you for being And The Coral Castle by Andrew Peterson. Not that it has anything to do with my life. I just ended up for King and Country. For King and Country. All right. I just listen. It doesn't right. matter like who or what. It just is nice. Or now we are free. God only knows. God only knows. Nice. Ooh. Song Rainbow by KC, what, KC, whatever her last name is. Yes, I love her. With her. My NF or Owl City, yeah. yeah. Depending on what kind of grieving you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> man. Happy Dance by Mercy Me because it was played at a funeral for a loved one. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really healthy. It's really good to, to hear that you guys have those things because 
you know, sometimes when I feel like I need to grieve and I can't quite like get there, music can really help kind of bridge that gap. And if, and if the, and if, and if the only cure for grief is to grieve, it's important to figure out ways that can help you get there sometimes when you're feeling a little bit like you don't have permission or it's not okay. Um, I've, I've done it to child again. Wow. Well, I didn't, I've done it to child again once well, I didn't, I, that's going to sound weird on this recording. Anyway, <laughs> there's a Spanish hymn. <laughs> El Señor. Yeah. Nice. For me, it's Rich Mullins. If I really need to grieve, I just put Rich Mullins on and about, you know, three lines in, I'm, I'm gone. Uh, anyway, yeah, whatever not. Anyway, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> in the face of the noble work that is being done, it can be hard to feel permission to grieve. Do any of you struggle with feeling permission to grieve? Is that even a thing for anyone here? Or most of you, most of the time, feel like, yeah, my parents are pretty awesome and my friends are pretty awesome and I have permission to grieve. Christ, our hope in life and death because it was sung week after week at our church in Thailand after, yeah. It really encourages me to hear this. I hope that remains true for most of y'all's life, that you continue to feel like you have permission to grieve because that can be something that ebbs and flows. I've gone through seasons of my life where I have not really felt like I had permission to grieve and I didn't want to take time to grieve. I've gone through seasons of my life where it's been really easy. And so I just, if you're in a season right now where you feel good permission to grieve, praise the Lord for that. That is amazing. All right. I do want to say something that like the biggest thing in my life that has not given like that has denied me permission to grieve has been lack of time and not necessarily a person or some like someone saying I'm not allowed to or myself saying I'm not allowed to it's just the time so I've had to learn that it's really hard to make the time it's important to make the time to grieve how do you do that that is such a powerful insight nod I love that you said that how do you do that? How do you give yourself time? Well, first, I, if there's like, if my day is too packed and then I'll, I'll have to like cancel something maybe. And then, but most importantly, I have to hide my phone away from me because if my phone is around, it's just a distraction. Um, yeah. Sometimes I go out into the woods so that all the other things that might have filled my day aren't aren't like tempting me anymore so mm. like i have to make the conscious decision to step out of my regular life to find the time that's really good thank you for sharing that that's awesome all right let's go to the next slide interesting hmm can someone read this <laughs> I can. Thank you. Slow down and enjoy life. It's only the scenery you miss by going too fast. And you also miss the sense of where you're going and why. What does that mean? What is Eddie Cantor talking about here? What stands out here? I had no idea the slide was coming up, by the way. It was just like Nod maybe new, and it was the perfect transition to this slide. So well done, Nadia. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so what does it mean to slow? How do you slow down and enjoy life? What does that look like? I think stop like I think it helps to stop worrying about all the details and treating every activity like a job that you just have to do sometimes especially when there's sort of this routine that you keep on doing over and over you don't enjoy the little moments that God gives you you tend to gloss over them and like I have to do this this is my responsibility and and just focusing too much on the uh, 
I guess, working aspect. Not that that's always bad, but if you miss the good things, the little things that God puts in your way, then it definitely is uh, unfortunate. It's really good, Jacob. Thanks for sharing that, man. Do you guys, um, do you guys ever find yourself living for the weekend or living for a break or living for whenever school's over or definitely like, can anyone relate to that? Yeah. Yeah. Like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, it's lovely to hear your voice. Please say more. Tell me more about that. Yes, um, yes. So this last summer, I took four classes over the summer. So uh, I feel like I've been running since like the beginning of last school year, trying to get school stuff done. Mm. So once Christmas break finally got around this year, it's like, finally, I actually get an actual break. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And I think, do you ever feel like when you're in the midst of that crazy rat race, that you miss the sense of where you're going and why that you kind of lose the, like, what am I even doing this for? Yeah. 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 Relate to that. My wife is, uh, is, has been really helpful. I am such a, uh, my people who know me know that I'm very much like this. I'm like, Oh man, I can't wait till we're going to hang out again. I can't wait till we're going to hang out again. What's the next thing we can do together? And it's almost as if living for the evening until I realized it's Monday, so I can't read The Hobbit after all. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> anyway, so like, like it's, I've been had, I've had people say to me every once in a while, like, "Hey, Caleb, we're we're hanging out right now. Let's enjoy this space." Like, yeah, there will be time in the future, but but the way I I the way that I've really like been chastised the most is you know when i go for that third piece of pie it's like i eat really fast i don't know if any of you eat really fast maybe some of you are afraid massively fast maybe some, it's a problem. Maybe some of you are afraid that the food is going to disappear so you're just like oh man i really gotta eat this you know uh as fast as i can so i can have at least two more cookies or whatever and and then you lose the ability to actually savor and enjoy what you're eating or drinking and instead of enjoying it and savoring it you uh you just cram it in your face and then it's gone and it's really helped me to try and slow down my eating and drinking and and slow down when i'm with people and not miss life always looking ahead to the next fun thing or the next thing that's coming up yeah, you did. So, how do we how do we learn to savor? No, it's okay. Leave it up. It's good. How do you learn to savor things? What helps you to savor and to slow down? For me, I'm being told to. Oh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was going to say just, I mean, it's a habit you have to form, but a habit of thankfulness. Like even like for little things, like sometimes if I can't think of anything else, I'm like, I thank you that I got to have a sandwich today. Sandwiches are delicious. Thank you, Lord. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good. I think this is kind of how it goes for, for most of us, maybe, is we savor the last bite. <laughs> I savor all my, I don't savor my Christmas candy. I savor my last piece of Christmas yeah. candy because it's all I have left. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or the first one because you want to save them and then you. Like, yeah. But then there are those of you, I know, I know you're, you exist in this room who still have candy from like, uh, you know, three Valentine's days ago, you know, for like three years ago. You, you have candy that you've been saving and you're going to enjoy it someday. I married that person. She has stuff all over our house from all over. Who knows when my sister was that way too. It was so annoying. I don't know how many of you had a sibling like that. It, like you would both get candy for something and then yours would be gone and theirs would like, like, what are you doing? And you've had it so long. It's like bad now. What do you like? So you have to find a balance. 
you have to find a way to like enjoy the things that you have and not like save them until they go bad, but also learn how to savor them. And these are really, really important things. And I think that the reason I like that slide is because I think grief, not that we want to savor grief necessarily, but if we want to get the fullest, the fullness out of life, we have to learn how to take time to grieve. We have to learn how to honor grief. And honoring it means taking time to do it and understanding it's a part of living a healthy life. And so I really appreciate like how Nod's perspective on that. Like the biggest lack of permission is not honoring the time that it is required. And it doesn't mean I have to grieve all the time every day, but it means that it's important to take time every day to at least consider the things that I might need to grieve and, and giving it its space. Just like I don't want to just get lost in grief, like savoring my candy for like years and years and years. And I don't want to just overlook it and just eat it as fast as I can and move on to the next thing. I want to honor it. Okay. Can someone read this beautiful quote we have up here? Yeah, go ahead, Eva. The reason why we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. Yeah, so what stands out to you in there? What pops? Um, I think it's because a lot of people um, have a cheery outside, but they actually are insecure on the inside. But it's really because they're comparing their, themselves with what they're seeing on social media and things like that. So it's not always good. You have to take it, know that what you see on social media isn't always going to be the realistic things because people you don't know what's going on behind scenes of their pictures that they post or things like that you don't know what's actually happening yeah that. yeah that's really really good it's really good um has anyone else struggled with this has it, can anyone else re anyone else relate to feeling insecure because you're comparing what you know about yourself to what you see in other people I think it's really important that we understand everyone grieves. It is a normal part of being a human being. People can project that they don't grieve, that they're always all together, that nothing ever impacts them. Yeah, that's true. It's very easy to do that. I agree. That's and <laughs> that then that that can make you feel really bad sometimes. Um but but I think it's really important to normalize the reality that like everyone here on this Zoom call has probably had a lot of grief in their life. And not everyone here, have you seen them grieve or, have, or, or maybe will you see them grieve? But that doesn't mean that Jeremy doesn't grieve. I mean, oh, I don't wanna pick on anyone, but that doesn't mean that we don't grieve. I remember Jeremy over at my house a few weeks ago watching his favorite team just get crushed and annihilated. And I could see the grief. I mean, he hit it well, but I knew it was there. But I'll share my own story. I remember I was in Thailand, just saving the world, just loving the youth of our, of our nation, you know, just like I am a missionary hero going to Thailand to, to <laughs> baptize the kids of this world, you know? And I woke up really early in the morning and Nadia will remember this really well because this poor person had to like, Put up with me that day. I woke up really early in the morning and I watched the Dallas Cowboys get beaten in the playoffs by the Green Bay Packers. And like my heart just fell out of my, I was so sad, but I didn't want to admit that I was sad. I didn't want to admit that I was grieving. I just wanted to be left alone. <laughs> and I, it took me so long to actually be like, guys, I'm so sad that my team lost because I minimized it because here I am trying to do this good work and it's just a stupid little team and I'm over and there's this adventure and there's all this fun stuff and we're going to go do these cool things. And I just didn't want to take time to grieve and I just didn't want to admit it felt silly to me. It felt stupid to me to be like, guys, my team lost and I'm sad, <laughs> but that's how I felt. 
And instead of that grief, I think, lasting maybe five minutes, it lasted like three or four hours minimum. And then finally, I got over the fact that they had lost and I moved on with my life. And, um, but I think it can be like that sometimes for all of us, where we minimize the grief or we compare our grief to a higher good or we ignore our grief. And then it becomes a much bigger issue because we're not dealing with it. Can you guys relate to that? Does any, do any of you have a story like that you want to share? Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. How about this? Lack of comfort in time of trouble or worry. Have you ever felt like you haven't received the comfort when you have really needed comfort, when you've been grieving? Oh, I do that all the time. I say that. Really? All right. It's like, not that bad. Think about this for this part. Like, at least you've got this. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm an optimist. And I don't want other people to be sad. Eve is an optimist, she says, and doesn't want other people to be sad. So she says, this is a message she can often actually give to other people. You shouldn't complain about a few hardships in light of all the good we are able to do. Do you ever give yourself, I also struggle with that message. Do you, do you guys, do any of you relate to that? Ever told yourself that or received that from someone else? This one's a tricky balance too, I think. I think we have people in our lives who can tend to grieve things that we can feel are a little bit ridiculous. And when that happens, it can be really hard to actually say, wow, that is really hard. I'm really sorry that happened to you. And I'm sure that like <laughs> people have seen me that way when I've grieved losses in sports or whatever. And I know that I've seen other people that way. Um, but if we, don't, if we don't receive comfort when we are in trouble, when we are worried, when we are grieving, what do you think happens to us? What do you think that results in? You kind of come become like protective, like you don't want to open up because you don't think people will care or yeah, they'll mock you or Yeah. Absolutely. You don't want to open up because of worry you'll be stinged. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if every time I was grieving something, someone made fun of me or ignored me or chose not to comfort me, I would stop. You know, one of the saddest things that like this reminds me of is like what you hear about, you hear about babies in orphanages that like they stop crying, right? Yeah, we, we get hardened and we can't receive care. Absolutely. And so these babies, they stop crying because when a baby cries, you know, in a normal scenario, a mom will come or a dad will come or a sibling will come and pick it up and hold it and, and try and take care of its needs. But when a baby is in an orphanage and, you know, there's too many babies, there's too much, there's not enough care to go around and the baby is, is left there uncared for, babies stop crying and it's eerie. If you've ever been into an orphanage like that, it's so eerie to go in there and to like the baby doesn't cry. So the baby, that's how the baby tells you what's wrong. But if, the, if it's trying to tell you what's wrong and, and you're not needing its needs, you're not changing its diaper or, or feeding it or whatever, eventually it'll stop crying. And that, is that good for the baby or bad? What do you think? Well, it's not great. <laughs> it's not great, why? Why isn't it great? Why is it bad? It shows them that they aren't loved or being loved. Yeah. Nobody is caring. Need. Like if, if the baby is starving, but they don't cry out for, like they don't cry for food, then they're not going to receive food. Exactly. Exactly. I, I can tell you that through this experience of not being touched as babies, that carries on into adulthood of not wanting 
physical touch and they have uh, social detachment disorders and they have trouble attaching to people emotionally and that the lack of care there really ripples through their life for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy, for sharing that. I appreciate that. It's really, really like God. What did God design us to be, to do? And he designed us to comfort each other, to care for each other, to live in harmony with each other, to consider others' needs as more important than our own. And when we don't receive that care, it can be really, really hard. Just like a baby can get really damaged when they stop crying and they stop crying out for care and they, st they stop receiving that care. We too get really damaged when we stop crying out for care, when we stop learning how to cry out for care. And part of the reason I really wanna talk about this is I wonder if some of you have been ignored or you felt like you haven't been comforted when you've really had something serious happen to you. And I urge you, like we as a body need to be good, we need to do, a, I, I want to do a better job of demonstrating a desire to comfort and care for the people in my life who need it. Even if what they're mourning isn't something that I really understand. And I, and I wanna urge you to, to learn how to ask for help again, if you need it. To learn how to, how to like grieve and, and to trust again. And that's really hard. But if that's you, then I wanna ask the Holy Spirit to help you because it's so important. It's so important that we don't allow ourselves to become hardened. You know, one of, one of the verse that I was reading tonight um, in my group, because we were talking about grace, um, Nada, I think is actually memorizing these verses, which is so awesome, because she's so awesome. But it's in, it's in uh, Hebrews 12, it says, make sure that none of you miss the grace of God. And I think that's a verse we, we need to take seriously. Like we need to make sure that none of us here miss the grace of God, miss, miss the reality that God really wants to comfort. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Who can read this for me? Whoa. Yeah, go for it. I'm so misunderstood that people misunderstand me when, even when I tell them I'm misunderstood. <laughs> Can anyone relate to that? <laughs> well, how does that impact grief, do you think? Yep, LOL. <laughs> oh, man. This is a, kind of a deep question here, but how does that impact what we're talking about? How does that touch on <clears throat> an inability to grieve? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, Jay. <laughs> if we can't be understood, even when we try to explain the misunderstood, we can't then, grieve with other people. Yeah, we can't grieve with other people because if we try to explain that we're misunderstood and someone understands that we're misunderstood, then they can at least recognize that they misunderstand us and maybe come to better understanding. But if they still don't understand us even when we say we're misunderstood, then it's like there's no connection, there's no point in keeping on trying to be understood. So what's the point of trying to keep being understood? So then how do you grieve with someone? Right. Right. How can you mourn with those who mourn if you don't even know that they're mourning? <laughs> also, if it's from your point of view, you could, if you're thinking that you're misunderstood, and you're thinking that even if you tell them people that they're going to misunderstand you, if you're expecting them to misunderstand you, the way that you say it is probably not going to get across to them because you're not trying to get them to listen because you know, you, you feel like you know in your mind that you're going to be misunderstood. So it's a mindset too. Yeah. That would be that would be so demotivating to share if every time I shared people misunderstood what I was trying to say. Um, 
Have you ever felt like that as an MK that people just like misunderstand you and do not, cannot fathom your grief because they just can't relate to it? Yeah. I think I like to think about it a little bit like this. Think of like one of your like favorite movies that you love what what so how to train your dragon how to train your dragon sure that is a great movie when i'm watching that movie with people who like it and understand it and they get it and the scene comes on where the thing happens i think one of the most quotable movies ever uh is like the princess bride and people just like they get it and it's funny and you know you're watching it and it's great and it, it makes the whole experience so much fun. But have you ever watched a movie with someone who just didn't get it? Yes. Oh, man. And it's the worst, isn't it? Oh, it's so boring. They're like, just do it on the What's going on? Like, What's going on? Like, don't listen and watch. Or, yeah, all my siblings, like, every time. Really watch movies with children. One of my favorite siblings. movies. Yeah, it's such a good movie. Oh. One of my favorite movies to watch is this movie called Pure Luck. And it just and I just die laughing every time I watch that movie. <laughs> Yeah, we'll watch it. But you have to enjoy slapstick humor because this guy just gets beaten up all the day. It's so funny to me to watch people like one of my favorite scenes is like he sticks, he like he's going to drink and he sticks a straw up his nose. It's just so funny. And he just gets so badly hurt. But I have so many friends who hate slapstick and they don't get it at all. And it's like, I don't want to watch a movie with you if you don't understand slapstick. My grief is the same way. I love it, actually. Really appreciate it that Jeremy can relate to sports grief. You know, I know so many people who just don't get sports grief, but it's so helpful and healthy to me because he understands, man. He knows what it feels like. And so we can like commiserate together. And it's really helpful when you find someone who can understand the grief that you're going through and you know they can really understand it. And <clears throat> there's a level of comfort there that's really powerful. But it's really hard sometimes. And I love our group because our group in many ways can understand the grief that is common to MKs, the grief that is common to transition, common to losing your world, common to all kinds of the things that we talk about here. And I love that. All right, let's go on. Uh, so yeah, who can read the the sign on the left? The one that's all right. All the all the different ones? Yeah, just read all of them. Okay. It's not that bad. I should be over it by now. I can't let it hurt. I shouldn't focus on the negative. I think I eat, I work, I do anything I can to not think about it. Denial. Right. So, well, man. <laughs> so, let's just focus on this one for a minute. Which one of those statements, like, do you resonate with, if any? Like just type it out or, or speak it out. Is there anything on the denial one that you resonate with? It's, it's not that bad. It's not that bad? Yeah, it's not that bad. I should be over it by now. I should be over it by now. I can't let it hurt. I shouldn't focus on the negative. I shouldn't focus on the oh. negative. That can be linked, I think, often to the idea that grief is a sign of weakness or a lack of faith, you know, because our faith, you know, can can say, well, never don't focus on the negative. Just believe in the power of God. And I think, well, if you're focusing on the negative, do you trust God? Uh, and then it can make us feel weak in our faith, I think, sometimes. I don't know if you felt that way, but I think there's a link. There can be a link to that one a little. Um, I should be over it by now. So why is denial, like, would, would you have actually recognized some of those statements as denial? Like, if, like, I think that's a big deal, right? Like, sometimes we hear these things, we maybe say these things, but we don't necessarily think, oh, that's me living in denial. Can anyone else relate to that? Are there, like, would you have recognized that as denial? It's not denial. Yeah, which one wouldn't you have recognized as denial? Um, I shouldn't focus on the negative. I shouldn't focus on the negative. Okay. I should be over it by now. I should be over it by now. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can. I would recognize it if it was a conscious denial, like I do anything I can not to think about it, but maybe not the others. Right. Okay. And I think it's important then that you recognize that when you say these things, it does reflect a, 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 a part of you that's living in denial. It's not that bad compared to what, you know? I should be over it by now. Why? I can't let it hurt. Well, why not? You know, sometimes we say these things because we want to avoid and we want to deny and we want to excuse. But what we're trying to do here is say, you know what? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes allowing my focus to be on the negative is the fastest way for me to, to, to move through. And I'm not saying we're trying to get through fast. I'm just saying it's faster than holding on to it and never getting through. You know, some things we grieve for a very long time. Like my story about the game. Like if I just said, wow, this really stinks. I'm really sad. Bummer. Five, probably five minutes later, I would, have been, I would have been fine. Instead, I was like, oh, it's not so bad. I should be over it by now. I shouldn't focus on the negative. I can't let it hurt. And it just lingered and lingered and lingered and lingered. It's important not to deny it because when we deny it, what can't we do? When we deny it, what can't we do? Let it go. Yeah, we can't let it go. We can't grieve it. Grieving it is how we get through it and let it go. All right, so how about the quote on the right? Who can read that one for me? Maybe I don't cry, but it hurts. Maybe I won't say, but I feel. Maybe I don't show, but I care. Can anyone relate to that one? Creed's raising his hand here. Anyone else relate to that at all? Kieran? Yeah. A lot of you, yeah. Eva, Lydia. I saw Anna raise her hand. That was Definitely. Really yeah, Luke. Michaela just raised her hand. That was really nice. Joshua does. And I think what's really powerful about this is sometimes we are so focused on the outward signals for grief that we deny the inward reality of grief. And I think that's not only important for me, but it's important for me as I live in community with you. There are some people who you will never know that they're grieving or how deeply they're grieving but that doesn't mean they're not grieving. So let's move on to the next one. So in what ways, in what ways do you feel like your grief is discounted? In what ways have you felt like your grief has been discounted? I think this question is a bit like, I think it would be really healthy to do this question if possible in a breakout room. And I'm not sure if we can do that while recording. Is that possible? I can pause recording and then break out. Yeah, let's do that. Let's pause the recording and then let's answer that question. Um, and that was really helpful for me, actually. I was surprised. I was wondering, did you discover anything there that you maybe didn't realize before? Uh, was there any like, oh yeah, this is how my grief has been discounted. Was there any revelation? No, we only have one more slide actually. And uh, so I don't know that we need to, well, you've recorded, sweet, let's do it. You're awesome. And the last slide for tonight. Grief, who can read this beautiful quote for me? I can. Awesome. Grief is like the ocean. It comes. Is this sound out for anyone else? 
Yeah, yeah. it's up for us. Someone else who has good sound, read this for me. Sorry, Luke. I'm just going to go ahead and read. Um, go. Grief is like the ocean. It comes in waves, ebbing and flowing. Sometimes the water is calm and sometimes it, it's overwhelming. All we can do is learn to swim. What stands out to you there, guys? What pops from that quote? Ebbing and flowing. Yeah, why is that? It's never quite the same. It it some days it's easier and some days it's harder and you're never really sure how it's gonna feel at a particular time. And you can't always control it. Can't definitely can't control the ocean. Yeah, it's really good. That's really good. All we can do is learn how to swim. Like all we can do like that just like there's a finality about like that's the only thing that we can do yeah it's interesting that you mentioned that because they make people wear life jackets in lakes still because of the current underneath the in, in certain like lakes and things and it's like they're worried that even if you can swim it'll still be a problem because you'll get sucked away by the current of like the river or something yeah so sometimes swimming's not even enough When you, uh, you know, yeah, what else? Do we have any other thoughts here? Nod has not spent a lot of her life as a lifeguard. You know, I don't know if any of you, the rest of you have lifeguarded. And that, I, I just thought of that when you said that, Jay, because I think that just gives such like, like purpose and meaning to like, we have a community and you're right, maybe sometimes us learning how to swim, like we're not great swimmers and we need each other to help, to rescue, to be there and to be available. I'm very grateful for the people in my life when I've been grieving the most who have been there to help me um, when I just was really bad at learning how to deal with my own grief. Um, it's so true, sometimes you can wake up feeling great and grief can get a hold of you sometimes during that day. And it can be really overwhelming. And learning how to swim, I think, part of that, since it, that we're, this is an analogy, obviously. What are some, what are, like, what does that mean? What are some of the things in grief that are learning how to swim? Anything tonight, even, that you heard, like? Learning how to kind of deal with uh, waves, uh, depending on how large it is, uh, and finding uh, ways to uh, get your head above the water so you don't drown. Mm. Right. I'm glad you said that, Eva. I think nice. I think some. I think. I think one of the ways we talked about learning how to swim tonight is like listening to music to help you grieve. Um, not discounting your own grief. Um, not. What else? Can you think of anything else we talked about? Like that is like learning to swim. Finding ways to get rid of the chains that might be uh, keeping your head below water, like uh, discounting the fact that you are, that your head is underwater. Right. To not even ignoring the fact that you're grieving at all. It's a good one. And I think one that I think is really particularly powerful and meaningful is kind of what we just came back from is learning how to share my grief with others learning how to allow others into that place. So, um, I just wanna, I wanna close tonight in prayer. And uh, I, 
I know that uh, we just were we broke into pairs and we talked, but um, it is nine o'clock, so I want to be I want to honor that. But I encourage you to take time today, if you can, or or this week, and find someone you can share a grief with that's been discounted in your life. Find someone who you can talk to about that, and maybe pray with them. I think prayer is another great way to help deal with our grief, and we can talk more about that later. So let's pray. God, I, I thank you that you see all of our grief, big or small. God, and, and that, that, it's, that we are important to you, that our grief is important to you. And I think for me particularly, it's, it's comforting to know that you understand it. You made me. <laughs> you understand why I grieve the things I grieve, and you understand how I grieve them. And it's important to you, God. And so I ask that you would help us as we, as we think about our grief to be willing to take the time. I just praise you for that insight from Nadia, to be willing to take the time to grieve the things that we so often just discount and move past and to understand them and inevitably to bring them to you to heal them. Pray your blessing on us tonight and your protection and thank you for your Holy Spirit in Jesus name. Amen. All right, guys, it's been a